Hello Advanced Tale Historians and welcome to our next lesson in our Stalin topic. We are looking at the Great Patriotic War aka Russia's involvement in World War II and I know that um, some of you this is your dissertation topic area so we have some experts on that um, to chat to about in our weekly drop-in session but for this lesson we're kind of just going to go through the information in particular we're going to talk about kind of some of the main battle areas and events of the Great Patriotic War. We're going to think about the impact of the Great Patriotic War on the Soviet Union and we're going to have a think about the kind of reasons for victory and the kind of factors we might be looking at for a potential essay for this topic. So our learning intention is to look at the impact of World War II on the Soviet Union. Um, obviously still in Stalin in power and you want to have explored how the Soviet Union was able to turn the disaster that the Great Patriotic War and the German invasion started out as into this victory that became one of the greatest victories in a military sort of style um, in history. Assignment wise from the textbook for Corn and Fine it's page 342 to 363. Um, lynch book that we used for a previous task it does have a really fantastic chapter as context about this which I would really strongly recommend that you go away and have a look at. Um, it's chapter 5 and it has some really nice kind of context on this as well that you might find quite useful. So when the Germans began invading um, the USSR in June 1941, they basically swept all before them in this like kind of tidal wave invasion. It brought disaster into the Soviet Union who were woefully unprepared for them. However, the situation was turned around. Stalin's role was central to this, um, actually fairly controversial as well because a lot of people blamed him for the reason that they were not ready. Um, however, there was a massive economic effort um, there was the development of the Red Army at this point in time and an endeavour and resilience of the Russian people that pretty much could not be anticipated by the Germans which ultimately led to their defeat and Soviet victory. The horrors that were inflicted by the Germans in their war of annihilation, which was what they were really doing, made the Russian people receptive to wartime propaganda by Stalin and the communists. And there was this massive upsurge in patriotism, which is why it's referred to as the Great Patriotic War in Russia. The Soviet Union made a major contribution to the defeat of Hitler, which is quite often overlooked during kind of the Cold War era, which obviously follows this this topic era, um, but they were really instrumental in the defeat of Hitler by the Allies at the end of the Second World War. So the reason that we refer to it as the Great Patriotic War, um, the very first speech that, the so that Stalin gave to the Soviet people after the German invasion, which was actually a couple of weeks after, which we'll come back to in a minute, talked mostly about a, a patriotic war of all of the people. What the propaganda that came out from this and the speech itself actually did was he was trying to motivate the population to see the Germans as a thing to be driven out, echoing kind of past wars with, with heroes throughout history, such as Napoleon um, being driven out by these heroes of history in 1812. And it would be known as a patriotic war by the people. Now, he was using this term to encourage them to get involved this idea of them saving the Soviet Union against this foreign invader that uh, you know saving their homes from attack and it soon begins to appear in Prada it's still used today to refer to the era um, in Russia as well but it is the war era that we're referring to between the USSR and Germany and her allies so roughly between the 22nd of June 1941 and the 9th of May 1945 is when this is really taking place it was the greatest war in history, without a doubt, hands down. Definitely the greatest war in history. More troops were engaged for the longest period of continuous fighting along the longest fronts than any other war. There was twice as many combatants killed as those of all of the nations killed on all of the fronts in the First World War. Um, and again, as we said just at the beginning there, too often, especially during the Cold War era, the Soviet's contribution to the defeat of Hitler has been greatly underestimated. 
At no time were there less than two thirds of the German forces being committed to the Eastern Front. And the sufferings of the Soviet people were absolutely enormous. It was at this point that the Second World War was both lost and won. It was this point where the German forces were stretched too thin, which made the breaking point for the Allies easier to actually obtain. So without having this, it is very unlikely that the outcome of the Second World War would have been the same as we obviously know it to be. This maps a really nice outline um, of the Eastern Front and where kind of things took place and where things happened. You've got the kind of Russian advance lines um, here where we can see them being pushed kind of back into this green region of the USSR and then pushing back to it, um, back to the first red line by 1943 and then by 1944 actually all the way back into Germany itself as well to try and you know force the, the kind of the advance backwards. So the 22nd of June 1941 the German army launched Operation Bar Barossa against the Soviet Union. Took the Russians completely by surprise. We're going to look at that um, in a bit more detail in a minute. Most of the Soviet aircraft were destroyed on the ground that first day. The Germans then swept in and most of the very confused Red Army put up a very limited resistance and then deserted in large numbers. Then between June and December, the Red Army lost a ridiculously high amount of people um, being killed in action and another ridiculously high number of people being taken prisoners or prisoners war. Um, over two million who were dead on top of that from starvation, disease and maltreatment by February 1942 ultimately results in mass amounts of death and casualties. By September the siege of Leningrad had begun which we're going to talk about in more detail and Kiev had fallen with the loss of half a million men. Um, they were encircled because Stalin refused to make a strategic withdrawal when he was told to. Eventually his advisers actually bodily had to remove him and take him so that he wouldn't be captured. By October there's panic in Moscow. The government offices are evacuated. Stalin is still refusing to leave the city. The areas um, lost in 1941 were some of the most industrial, developed and fertile in the USSR and it contained two-fifths of the population. It really didn't look like the Soviet Union could do anything against this and it did look like defeat was inevitable. However, after the initial shock of this, the Russian resistance stiffened and the Germans began to suffer casualties at a far, far higher rate and they did begin to fight back. Textbook wise, pages 343 to 346 give you a really nice overview of the war on the Eastern Front um, in a wee bit more detail. So, now that I kind of know what we're talking about, let's kind of go back and look at each bit, drill down and look at each bit individually. Ultimately, the Great Patriotic War was a direct consequence of the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Now, the Nazi-Soviet Pact had several consequences. One, it lulls Stalin into a false sense of security. He is very much sure that he has time or he has bought time to try and stop Hitler invading for long enough that Russia will actually be able to do something about it. Um, to build this military up so that they have a defence. The second thing it does is it enables Hitler to secure his western frontier by defeating France in 1940 and then turning his attention on Russia. And lastly, it left the Soviet defences unprepared against a German offensive because they didn't think that they would actually go against the pact as quickly as they did. This leads us to Operation Barbarossa, which we've mentioned briefly. So the 22nd of June 1941, the German army launched Operation Barbarossa. It was a massive invasion plan for the Soviet Union involving over 3.5 million Axis troops and 4,000 tanks on a 1,800 mile front. The German army was divided into Army Group North, Centre and South, so three areas. It was a three-pronged attack towards Leningrad in the north, Moscow in the centre and Stalingrad in the south, where their whole goal was capturing the oil fields of the Caucasus region, um, which would be crucial to them in their development moving forward. 
Speed was essential to the success of Operation Barbarossa. It was necessary to capture these key objectives before the onset of winter and obviously before the Soviet war machine with its superior resources of tanks and aircrafts could actually be put into full operation because Stalin's focus on military developments had actually paid off. There actually were kind of a superior resource for the Soviet Union compared to Germany, which is why it had to attack as quickly and as decisively as possible. The initial phase of the operation was highly successful. Um, Stalin pretty much chose to dismiss reports of what was being told to him as an intimate invasion. He did not actually think this was going to happen. He kept clinging to the idea that the pact would kind of be important and save them. Um, in the very first few days of Barbarossa happening, he appeared almost paralysed. He was stunned. He failed to issue orders. He refused to believe that Hitler had actually broken the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, it's referred to as, by some historians as Soviet paralysis. And ultimately what this did is it enabled the German army to advance quite rapidly through the Ukraine, um, through Belarus and across the vast sort of Russian steppe, which was ideal tank country. In the first four weeks of the offensive, hundreds of miles were gained and the Germans advanced rapidly towards Leningrad and Moscow. So Stalin's miscalculations about the effectiveness of the Nazi-Soviet pact definitely left the Soviet Union pretty much unprepared for this war, despite the fact that they actually had the superior um, forces at their disposal. He was also guilty of errors and poor leadership in the early stages of war. Even after he had kind of gotten over this Stalin paralysis, he was quite difficult to kind of control and to get his advisors to get him on side to actually decide what to do. Um, he had a panic attack after the invasion had started. Um, he failed to give leadership in the first few weeks, not just even the first few hours or days, the first few weeks of this invasion. He prepared to move the government away from Moscow to Samara on the Volga River and only decided at the very last moment to actually stay in Moscow, so confusing kind of ideas going back and forward. He relied too long on many inferior commanders. Remember, his purge of the army was now coming back to bite him. Um, they'd been promoted for political reasons after this purge and they were pretty much useless. He failed to address the nation until two weeks later and then at that point when he did, the tone and the content of his speech was about trying to repair this kind of damage that had been done to the cult of Stalin and to him as a leader and the appearance of a leader as it was about trying to encourage them to fight. So it appeared very different to his overall speech sort of mentality that he had been given previously. He was appealing to the patriotism, he was appealing to religion, he was appealing to unity amongst the nationalities as the basis of Russian strength. Again, linking it to this idea of fighting off these invaders like Napoleonic Wars had been. Now, if you think about this kind of question, why might Stalin's appeals to patriotism, religion and unity amongst the nationalities be it reflective of a position of weakness at this time? He's looking at the situation he's in, thinking about what he's done in terms of the purges and the situation that that has resulted in, alongside his inability to act when the kind of the chips were down. And in order to actively stay as leader, he knows that he has to make some sort of way of getting around that and, and making out that he had done this as as an early kind of point in the war but he was now asking the people to join together under him and he would lead them to victory. So it's in part about him kind of developing his leadership style from this kind of totalitarian you know fist of iron into this kind of leader who wants the people to be on side and needs the people to be on side and that's a very different situation for Stalin. Ultimately, Barbarossa fails. So despite the early advances, Barbarossa grounds to a halt as the Soviet forces do begin to mobilise. A huge Soviet force blocked the road to Moscow um, in July 1944. Many Russians initially actually did welcome the Nazis as liberators, but this was really short-lived because the atrocities that the German army were then inflicting upon the Russian people because it was a almost like a war of, of purity. They were getting rid of these people. 
it tended to alienate the, the Russians against the invaders and it helped that Stalin then used this as a, a foundation and a basis for this patriotism and things like that. There was a huge upsurge in this kind of partisan resistance against the Nazis with the, the idea of patriotism being all over the propaganda pieces and, and coming out of Prada and stuff like that. Also, in a slightly kind of less Stalin-related intervene point, there was the weather. The autumn rains had then turned the landscape into mud. The roads were poor, as they normally are in Russia, but the Russians are used to this, the Germans are not, and it made rapid advance very difficult. They were not able to act as quickly as they anticipated themselves being able to do. And then the winter brings the snow and the ice and war on the Eastern Front becomes this terrible war of attrition where the two sides are just kind of almost at a stalemate at points and just battling against one another, very similar to the situation in the trenches in World War One, except the devastation and the destruction is not being caused in just the trenches um, in these landscapes, it's been caused in the actual cities and villages and surrounding areas of these of these people. So the next couple of slides is talking about the different kind of main battle events of the Great Patriotic War. Um, the first one we're looking at is the Siege of Leningrad. So on the 6th of August 1941, Hitler orders Operation Nordlicht, which was the capture of Leningrad. In late August, the city came under a terrible bombardment from both the land and the air. It destroyed the industrial plants, factories and the transport links into Leningrad and it became known as the 900 days. It was a siege that lasted 900 days and became one of the most terrible events of the Second World War. Defence of the city was organised by General Zhukov um, who organised the defensive perimeter to try and keep them out of Leningrad. Over a million civilians were organised into Labour Corps to build the defences of the cities, which included trenches, barricades, tank traps and minefields. Although the city was virtually encircled, the Soviet forces were supplied during the winter via the ice road, which was across the frozen sort of Baltic wastes, which managed to kind of sustain them. And then when the summer rolled around, the city was supplied by the British and the French ships by the sea, which allowed them to continue their kind of their going. So the siege didn't really quite work the way that the Germans planned it to because they were able to get access to these goods. A Soviet counterattack was then planned, Operation Iskra. Um, it partially lifted the siege in January 1943, but the fighting continued for another year until eventually the German forces were defeated. In addition to over 300,000 military casualties, there was around about 1.2 million civilians in Leningrad in the area who died of starvation, disease or from lack of shelter in the cold winter. Most of the civilians were killed um, due to kind of the situation and the conditions rather than bombings and things like that. It was the starvation, disease and cold that got them. But ultimately, there were actually more civilians killed during the siege of Leningrad than there had been in both of the atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima during the same time frame. The Battle of Stalingrad then is another event during um, the Great Patriotic War, which sees the Soviets almost defeated, but then coming back to victory. Hitler had been determined to capture Stalingrad. Um, it was kind of like the model industrial city which had symbolised the successes of the five-year plans. Situated on the River Volga, it had the key kind of strategy points of the oil fields, so they definitely needed it. The German attack on Stalingrad was spearheaded by the 6th Army and commanded by General von Paulus. The Germans quickly captured quite a lot of the city. Soviet troops controlled only a very small perimeter on the west bank of the Volga and they launched a kind of determined counterattack across the river. The furious fighting took place around the factory district where the tractor factory continued to churn tanks off of the production line even as the battle was actually going. So they were pretty much building the tank, getting into it, fighting and another tank was being produced at the same time. 
On the 19th of November, Zhukov, the Soviet general, ordered Operation Uranus, um, which was a huge Red Army counter-offensive that effectively trapped the German forces in the Stalingrad kind of pocket area. They were trapped in there. Frozen and pretty much cut off from supply lines and from the rest of his potential forces, von Paulus, the German general, ultimately surrendered on the 31st of January 1942 against Hitler's orders. He had no choice. Of the 91,000 soldiers of the 6th Army taken prisoner, only 5,000 of them survived Soviet captivity. The destruction of the 6th Army was a turning key point in the Second World War. They were devastated in terms of military strength by this capture and this defeat of this particular group. The total German losses were estimated at over half of a million, with Soviet casualties actually being even higher than this, on top of already the casualty list from the Battle of Leningrad. On the 5th of July 1943 then, Hitler makes a final kind of desperate attempt to capture Moscow in Operation Citadel. Um, Kursk would go down as the largest tank battle in history outside of Moscow and the end of Hitler's aspirations on the Eastern Front. It was definitely a defeat after this. The German army managed to amass 700,000 troops, 2,400 tanks and 1,800 aircraft for the offensive, but by this point the Soviet forces were even larger and ready to rock with over a million troops at the Red Army's disposal and a superior number of tanks and aircraft because, like we said, um, during the Battle of Stalingrad, these factories were still producing continuously throughout the war. Again, Zhukov, the, the kind of general who has proven himself to be a fantastic mastermind and Soviet um, leader at this point in time, he is the one that plans the Soviet defences of the counterattacks. Twelve days of furious fighting between the two armies, Hitler ordered his very battered and very destroyed forces to withdraw feeling another Stalingrad was pretty much on the horizon. The Battle of Krusk, massive success, was followed by a Red Army advance pushing the retreating Germans back. Um, they managed to recapture Kiev in the autumn of 1943 and the German forces were gradually being pushed further and further back in fierce amounts of fighting which was still going on through the Ukraine, through Belarus and through Poland. By the spring of 1945 the Red Army was approaching Berlin. And this led to the Battle of Berlin um, between April 16th and May 2nd, 1945. Ultimately, it was a devastating blow for the German army. It resulted in the destruction of the German capital and the final Soviet victory in the Great Patriotic War. After that, the Soviet Union seized part of Berlin, and we obviously know how that works out into the Cold War era, because we've looked at that at higher. Ultimately then, thinking about how Soviet victory was actually achieved. So victory in the war was achieved basically through this extraordinary effort that was put in place by the Soviet people. We cannot underestimate the level of influence that Stalin actually did have over this victory. After his initial kind of shock and paralysis at the start of the German invasion, he actually showed a very remarkable amount of resolve um, to defeat this kind of intruder, this insurgent in, in his space. He urged um, and bullied the people to make as much sacrifice as they humanly could, and then some. And the term Great Patriotic War is obviously coined shortly after this German invasion to arouse the patriotism within the Soviet Union and the people, which does a lot of um, good for that and actually gets them on side with him. It's almost like they, they use this kind of atrocities of the German people and this idea of becoming patriotic to kind of cancel out the fact that Stalin, their, you know, their great leader, the person that the cult of personality was, was born around, did not actively act when the chips were down. Um, a medal, the Order of the Patriotic War was introduced, which again gave the people something to strive towards. By 1942, over half the national income is now diverted towards the military. Industrial production was reorganised with factories reassembled um, beyond the, the Urals to produce the goods that they needed for the military.
And despite severe shortages of coal, iron and steel, production continued um, to produce sufficient armaments to keep the Soviet war effort going. The railways actually became more efficient to get goods um, back and forward as much as possible. A land lease programme with the United States saw 17 million tonnes of war materials being sent into the Soviet Union. And this included thousands of tanks, aircraft and military vehicles, as well as armaments and other military goods. So they, they pretty much outnumbered and outgunned the German forces quite effectively and quite quickly. So over the next couple of slides, we're going to have a look at the factors that contributed to the USSR's victory over Germany. This could be potentially um, an essay topic. You might be looking at how each of these factors maybe did result in the victory um, from Soviet strengths to German weaknesses and to the contribution of the Allies. What you're going to do is categorise them into kind of three areas. You can do this as headings um, and then bullet points, you can do it as a, a table with three columns, or you could do it as three mind maps, it's entirely up to you, but you're going to use the next couple of slides to do that. And then ultimately what I want you to do is within each of these categories, just decide which one you think is the most significant factor within each and why you think that, and then maybe ultimately decide out of the three, which one do you think is the most significant out of the three, and just write this into your notes. So you might decide to do it as a table that looks like this. Um, this would probably be the quickest and easiest way to organise it, but it is up to you how you decide to do that. After you've used the next few slides to fill it in, remember what you're going to do is just highlight which of the three areas, which one you think is the most significant, and then out of these three, which is the most significant overall in Soviet victory over Germany. So a couple of things that we've got on the slide. We've got some cards here with information. I'm not going to read them out to you. You can pause the video um, and use them to kind of summarise and fill in your table, but it gives you kind of a, a various amount of knowledge and information about each one. So pause the video here and, and use this to fill it in. Another slide with some of your cards for this table. Again, I'm not going to read them to you, so you can pause the slides here, pause the video and fill them in on your table or your mind maps, whatever you're doing. And the last two cards here for you to fill in as well. And again, I'm not going to read them to you, but you can pause the video and use this to fill them in. Okay, in terms of impact of the war on the Soviet people, it had an absolutely devastating impact on the Soviet Union and its citizens. During the four years that the war continued, it was brutal warfare. The Soviet people were, were facing hardship and savagery in a way that was almost unparalleled in history, which is definitely saying something, considering if we've looked at all of the impacts and things of war and various things throughout this topic, civil war, um, collectivisation, five-year plans, to turn around and say that this is almost unparalleled in terms of their suffering is fairly um, disastrous for them. Up to 25 million people died, either as victims of warfare or through starvation, hardship and disease. Vast areas of the Soviet Union were devastated. Both sides adopted a kind of a scorched earth policy where pretty much while they were being forced to retreat, they burnt everything to prevent any resources and things that might be useful to the enemy being taken, which destroyed most of the land and most of the areas. Grain requisitioning was reintroduced as well, which resulted in starvation again for millions of people in the countryside areas, um, as well as massive bread lines and things within the urban areas as well. Many people in occupied territories were deported or forced into labour camps, where obviously things were not good for them either. Quite a lot of atrocities were committed in these occupied regions, um, often as kind of reprisals for any sort of partisan activity. So any patriotic activity resulted in immediate retribution by the Germans. Millions of Russian Jews, gypsies and other ethnic peoples were rounded up and transported back to the concentration camps, where it is very unlikely that, that they actually survived or they were unlikely to survive. Thousands of them were murdered by the SS in mass executions during this period as well. In terms of kind of Soviet defeat of Germany, a lot of the time we come back to this idea of Stalin's leadership. Um, some historians have made this argument 
that Stalin's victory in the Great Patriotic War owed more to luck than his own good leadership. And this is something we need to kind of think about. Was it the case that his leadership was good, but it was too late and it was pure luck that resulted in the victory? Or actually, was it a little bit more than that? So that's something for you to kind of keep in mind and think about which side you actually um, agree with. And we can talk about this during our live call this week about which side we actually think about. In terms of historiography, Ward criticised Stalin's role, um, especially considering he was given the title of Generalissimo. He says that the Generalissimo was short-sighted and careless of losses in terms of how he reacted to things. Unanimously, it is agreed that his initial responses, so Stalin's initial responses, were disastrous. More recently, revisionist school of thought has highlighted that many of Stalin's tactical strengths were actually the main reason why they were they were winning ultimately. Um, Hoskin, for example, repeatedly states that Stalin had particular gifted skill as a war leader, which he maybe didn't get involved right away, but as soon as he did, this really came through, which is the only reason they won, because obviously, if you think about the purged army, it needed this particular gifted leader, and that's what Stalin was. Russia itself had several strong advantages when they entered the war. Um, social historians such as Gill, for example, highlight the dedication and the sacrifice of the common population. It was something they were used to, so it was easy for them to kind of get behind the, the need for this with obviously such a large amount at stake with the, the Germans invading. Post the Glasnost period, um, pipes credits the Russian success to the mistakes made by the Nazis rather than the strengths of the Soviets, so that's kind of something to keep in mind as well. The general line is that Stalin's willingness to learn and adapt from his early errors at the beginning um, during Barbarossa helped to inspire discipline and suppress the discontent of the populace. The fact that when he did address them, he wasn't the, the kind of the leader they knew and the, the, the hard-nosed purger of people. He was Stalin, the requester, the, the man who was asking them to come together for the benefit of all, really made things different for the people. They were, they were happy to kind of do that and felt almost like his mistakes made him more human and more connectable in some ways. And Taylor in particular highlights the role of the people in terms of their self-sacrifice. Without them and without that economy element, it wouldn't have been possible for them to win. If we're writing an essay about the Great Patriotic War, there's a couple of different things that you might want to take into consideration. Um, Stalin's leadership is certainly one of the main ones that we've kind of looked at. The role of the generals um, as well, the German weaknesses. And the others that you might want to consider are the kind of geostrategic issues, um, economic factors within Russia and the Russian people itself. If I was doing an essay about this, depending if you have a named factor or not, probably the ones I would go with are Stalin's leadership, um, German weaknesses and the role of the generals and the Russian people I would combine into into two kind of into one factor and then I would maybe me talk about the economic factors as a fourth one um, to develop the argument a little bit further. So we're going to look at each of these in turn just a wee bit to kind of give a general overview um, and we will be doing an essay on this topic next week for you to kind of have a look at. So in terms of Stalin's leadership, the genius organisers were victories from Prada, July 1941. Um, Time magazine in 1942 said only Stalin fully knew how close Russia stood to defeat in 1942 and only Stalin fully knew how he brought Russia through. But Operation Barbarossa, launched in June 1941, saw 3 million German troops backed by tanks and aircraft into Russia. Stalin's initial shock was disastrous, as we saw, allowing the Germans to consolidate these early victories. Historians have questioned Stalin's reaction. Um, Overy claims there had been almost no systematic preparation. Alec Nove suggests that the leader was unwilling to even warn troops of the possibility of invasion because it made him look weak, because he signed the Soviet pact as well. 
So this may be particularly damaging to Stalin's military reputation, as recent publications have suggested that he had actually been warned prior to the attack up to about 80 times and refused to actually listen to it. Again, it's this kind of this idea of pride cometh before the fall. Was he actually too pride? too prideful in kind of keeping the, the idea of Hitler won't dare betray me and that he was unwilling to act and then when it actually did happen he just was so shocked he couldn't act. Stalin really did show a naive reliance on the Soviet, Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. Even maintaining grain exports to Germany right actually up until the eve of Barbarossa, he told the troops not to retaliate um, or provoke the Germans or even to retaliate to what he saw as provocation from the German forces. This early failure definitely allowed the Nazis to seize Russia's main territories in Poland and to occupy the Minsk sort of regions and stuff as well. By the end of September, Leningrad is now under siege and the Germans have crossed the, the river and are preparing to launch Operation Typhoon, where they're intending to capture Moscow. So really his leadership is not doing particularly well at that point. Also back to kind of him as a leader, his pre-war purging of the military had devastating impacts on the army. There was a loss of really trained leaders, there was an increased political control, stifled um, initiative and independent action, especially in the early days because nobody was really sure what was going on. The good quality tank and aircraft weren't in production at the outbreak of the war. It wouldn't be till later on that this actually happened and the ones that they did have had been destroyed quite quickly on the ground during the first couple of hours of, of Barbarossa. However, once Stalin recovered from this initial shock of invasion and the Russian resistance began to harden, Stalin seems to have become quite a proficient general quite quickly. He quickly took complete responsibility for overseeing proceedings, appointing himself the head of the Defence Committee set up in June 30th um, and Supreme Commander, the Generalissimo, of the armed forces in Russia. Unlike Nicholas II, however, during World War I, Stalin ensured that he was not associated with the early defeats, maintaining his image as this kind of infallible ruler, asking for the patriotic support and moving on from there. The Stavka um, General Staff was then set up in June 23rd, 1941, which was responsible for military operations. The JKO, um, the State Committee of Defence, was set up on the 30th of June 1941. It was centralised and it controlled the military, the political and the economic life of Russia, so it was a more force to try and, and kind of defend these areas. And then Gauz plan um, obviously produces the war plans. Decisions went to the small kind of committee of the JKO and it met daily to try and decide what to do. So he quite quickly organised, because that was what he was good at, remember, as party secretary, these various different branches of his his party and of the, the leadership to try and actually have areas that were focused on certain aspects with him in control and overseeing everything. His very first personal successes were from October and kind of November 1941. Having evacuated the parliament from the capital, Stalin remained there and organised a counter-offensive, which at a very high cost to both armies did eventually drive the Nazis back and effectively saved Moscow. He goes down as this kind of leader that single-handedly saved Moscow from the Nazi attack at this point. His key advantage and a factor increasingly highlighted in revisionist historian school of thought was his willingness to learn from his errors and refrain from making choices he was unsuited to make. If he could not make them, he then gave the decision over to one of these groups that he had set up that maybe had better expertise and once they had given him his view, he made the decisions based on actual facts from people who were more suited. Again, this is very different from Nicholas II's idea um, at the First World War period. Hoskins' historian claims that both Stalin and his senior commanders displayed some capacity to learn from their mistakes, and this was a huge, huge advantage for them. An example was Stalin's early habit of micromanaging every decision made, ranging from troop deployment to actions in the battlefield, and it was disastrous, and he learned that quite quickly 
he didn't want to be Nicholas again, so he abandoned this and actually gave the people the ability to act without him having to actually have a say. Zukov, this this obviously great um, general, claimed Stalin had poor practical knowledge of the preparation of operations. However, unlike the Nazis, who maintained a very rigid bureaucracy that limited the freedom of their generals to improvise, by the end of 1941, Stalin had revised this position and gave the generals this, this kind of freedom. He began sending his most talented generals to the front, but giving them few specific instructions, telling them basically to make the more in it, sort of decisions on the spot and on, on the, the hoof as they needed to. The benefits of this were particularly um, evidenced in the dispatch to Stalingrad by one of his generals who was able to actually help take it back and keep in control. Stalin starts distancing himself, obviously from the early massacres, and it helps him to build this effective propaganda campaign with patriotism at its heart. The betrayal of Barbarossa was emphasised in all of his speeches, um, where he also highlighted German racism even further. Stressing the German treatment of the peasantry and prisoners of war were absolutely vital in winning the support of the national minorities, as at first quite a lot of the Ukrainians in particular did see the Germans as liberators, which we've already talked about. Great figures from the past were used to promote and um, sort of courage in what both Westwood and Overy see as a master stroke by Stalin. Um, he also reconciled with the Orthodox Church after two decades of general persecution against them. This helped Stalin almost justifies and justifies almost justify and legitimize the kind of unpopular policies such as rationing and conscription. The support of the church also helped re-establish loyalty within the populace to the kind of the motherland and Sakwa believes that it was this and not loyalty to either Leninism or Marxism, or even to Stalin, that inspired the resistance. It was the fact that he had brought back something that had meant so much to the Russian people that encouraged them to continue. While support of the Russian people may have aided in conscription, we have a lot of recruits forming in Moscow, um, roughly about 16,000 of them actually forming a week which obviously reduces wartime discontent. Stalin's ruthless use of terror was equally effective in maintaining the discipline and helping to secure victory. Like Trotsky had done during the Civil War period, there was no choice for you to retreat if you were fighting. That was just not an option. Through the purges of the 1930s being abandoned, they then have the NKVD allowed to determine who really is being the cowards and who are actually fighting within the ranks and Stalin ruthlessly then enforced something called order number 270 which basically said commanders and commissars who leave the front would be shot and the families of the men who surrendered would be deprived of state assistance. This means that if they are starving they will starve to death and that is the simple situation. So Take kind of what Trotsky did in the Civil War and then times it by 100 and you have Stalin's reaction to things. Now ultimately this may have led to a senseless kind of loss of life with thousands of unarmed soldiers fighting to the death. However, it was successful in terms of strategy in that it halted the trend in the early battles when thousands of Russians were just simply surrendering. The order also placed a significant toll on the German manpower and resources because they just kept throwing people at them. On top of this, the officers were instructed to shoot any disobeying orders, again like Trotsky had ordered, um, which again led to a lot of people now focused on what they were trying to do for fear of death. Nov describes how industries related to the war were subjected to what we refer to as military discipline. Holidays were suspended, overtime was now compulsory. If you were not in the army at the front lines, you were in the army behind the front lines fighting to actually ensure the supplies were, de were, were done and, and distributed. Employees were not permitted to leave their job unless they were conscripted. That was the simple solution. You are either 
on the front lines or you are in the factories. Another historian, Lever, believes that the use of terror during the war actually increased motivation as the authoritarian rule appealed to people's patriotic pride and increasingly soldiers were willing to fight to the death for Mother Russia. It gives them that kind of element of control back. In terms of the role of the generals then, as another factor, um, Zuzkov's defence of Moscow in the winter of 1941-42 to was really the first real successful Soviet counter-attack. He has to be given that kind of benefit. Um, he also was able to call in the kind of newly arrived Siberian troops who were trained to fight in these harsh conditions. Uh, we've got General Chukov's uh, role vital in the defence of Stalingrad, especially in Operation Uranus, with the German Sixth Army being captured and, and sent to prisoner of war camps. In terms of the Nazi mistakes, Pipes agrees that Russia's willing manpower helped their victory. However, he also really does highlight the Nazi mistakes being a key, a key point. Hitler dismissed reports concerning the development of the Red Army. He underestimated the Russian forces after the disastrous kind of Finnish campaign. Whereas Hitler had claimed we only have to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. He genuinely believed this. But in reality, what he met with was a sustained resistance and his previous complacency and poor planning with regards to the Russian geography meant that his supply lines were actually soon overextended quite quickly, actually. This was exasperated by Stalin's scorched earth policy, which meant that the retreating Russians destroyed any agricultural areas they passed, which removed the potential of supplies from the Nazis. Um, a final mistake was the Nazi failure to allow for the climate. Russian soldiers had good experiences of the sub-zero winters and the scorching summers. The Nazis did not, and they did not prepare adequately for this. The Nazi weaknesses were perhaps best demonstrated at the Battle of Stalingrad, where it resulted in a resounding defeat for them. Stalingrad is a good example of the collimation, basically, of Russia's strength and German weaknesses battling it out together. In October 1942, Hitler obviously orders the seizure of the city, followed by a sweep of the kind of oil regions. In reality, the Nazis found themselves entrenched, facing a winter of guerrilla warfare and hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Nazi troops stationed in the city had equipment entirely unsuited to the Russian winter. A lot of their equipment froze or just was inadequate, whereas the Russian army had goods and materials like boots and hats and balaclava type helmets and made use of the special kind of oil petrol compound to maintain their weapons so they didn't freeze up and break. The Nazis were left basically to endure frostbite, jarring rifles and just ultimately not a very good situation for themselves. The layout of the city made it difficult for the panzer divisions and the iron mesh cement used in the construction of the works for the five-year plans left the buildings resilient to the preliminary artillery bombardment. So they couldn't destroy them, they couldn't actually get the panzer divisions in. General Malkintov um, showed impressive initiative using the Freedom's Stalin grant attempt to develop new strategies based on guerrilla warfare, which the Germans were not prepared for because they could not retaliate in the same way. Hitler had not granted them this freedom. And whilst this is an important example of Russian adaption and Nazi miscalculation, it was ultimately this tank battle at Kursk that turned the tide against Germany. Hitler had sought a victory with after the humiliation of Stalingrad, claiming the Battle of Kursk would shine like a beacon to the world. However, the, the Russian spy ring, um, Lucy, had forewarned Stalin, and with the aid of 300,000 Russian civilians, his generals were able to outflank the German tanks, and within three days, they'd halted the German offensive, as we have looked at. From there, the Germans were driven back to the frontiers of Romania, Poland and the Reich itself, all the way back to Berlin. So ultimately, Stalin's purge of the military in the 1930s weakened the army, damaged morale and stifled initiative. It contributed to the disaster of June 1941. The first few months of Germany's Operation Barbarossa were a disaster for the Soviet Union, but it was checked outside Leningrad and Moscow and had not achieved um, its objectives by the end of that year. 
By 1943, the Red Army had developed into an effective modern army and victory at Stalingrad was a turning point in the war. Stalin's contributions were influential, but there was a debate over whether the USSR defeated Germany because of him or in spite of him. The economy was seriously hit by early, early territorial try that one again, early territorial losses and Soviet command economy came into its own during the war, enabling it to produce more military hardware than Germany was. The strain of the war effort brought the economy close to collapse by the end of 1942. The Lend-Lease um, programme with the US made a significant contribution to preventing a collapse. It underlines the point that the USSR was part of a superior coalition Germany's allies were of little help to them, whereas Russia's were. Women's perseverance and determination played a vital and underestimated role in the USSR survival and triumph. In a people's war, patriotism and readiness for self-sacrifice were key factors in Soviet success. An appeal to patriotism, Russia's history and the hatred of the Germans were the key themes of wartime propaganda, which was very successful. Invading the USSR was a huge undertaking, Hitler's fanatical racism alienated the Soviet people and contributed to his defeat, and the Soviet contribution to the defeat of Hitler has generally been underestimated, as at no time there were less than two-thirds of Germany's forces committed to the Eastern Front, and it was here that both the Second World War was won and lost. Task-wise for this presentation um, and for this lesson, you should now download the Great Patriotic War Worksheet that you can see here and use it and the textbook, um, just the Corn and Fine textbook for this one, to consolidate your understanding of the Great Patriotic War. Um, once you've finished that, you're going to then move on to the essay task. You do not need to upload anything for this lesson, you just need to complete the work and your notes and then start work on the essay. Any questions or anything that you're not sure about, please put a note on the team or send an email and let us know how you're getting on.